Hello everybody, Dr. F. Scott Field here, and I'd like to introduce you to our newest sponsor. The NPTE Final Frontier is the review course that I wish was around when I took the board exam. For those of you who know my story, it took me a handful of times to pass that exam, and quite frankly, I really wish I had an an exam review course around, uh, just like the NPTE Final Frontier. Uh, Check out their website, npteff.com, and use the code HET at checkout for 10% off to all of our listeners and fans. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Field, and I've got with us a very familiar guest, longtime friend, longtime co-host of the episode, Dr. Brandon Pone. Brandon, how the heck are you, man? And better yet, the million-dollar question, what the heck have you been up to? Catch us up. Oh, man. Well, first of all, Scott, thank you so much for, you know, your help and role with this podcast from the beginning, because you and I pretty much created and made this partly in the beginning to what it is. Of course, we've had a lot of help from many great people along the way, um, not in, not just including Steph, but so many others. Um, but yeah, um, I know I've kind of stepped away from HET for a bit. And, you know, I've actually been getting some messages at times kind of asking why so i feel like i should probably yep. go on the record and kind of yeah likewise that. man so, likewise I, everybody's always asking so yeah. this is our chance to fill them in yeah no worries so to give a little background kind of at the time so i kind of really stepped away kind of around the time when COVID hit and because of that when COVID hit pretty much when i was working i ended up getting laid off and because of that obviously my priorities to be able to support myself and everything kind of changed so I was doing other things in the time frame and I'm just like you know hd has got to go on hold because I got to take care of me you know and as I was doing that I was just getting more caught up in trying to pick up more work shift and you know I just didn't really have as much time for doing the podcast as much but then when things kind of settled down it really made me kind of reflect you know on a lot of aspects with life meaning that you know I really didn't feel like I really had things balanced as well in terms of between work life, you know, and the podcast. Um, And honestly, I've just been kind of really kind of enjoying, um, you know, doing the other aspects of life. You know, there's a lot of other new hobbies I've taken up in between. There's a lot more um, things I've done as a clinician in between, which I've really liked pursuing. I got more involved with um, my state chapter at the time. Um, I've stepped away from that since then, but we can get into that a little bit later. Um, So I don't know. I just feel like I've just gone, I've just kind of explored new territory and I think I've just been really liking it. And, you know, ATT is always something I love and I'm not saying I wouldn't ever come back and co-host and do that at some points off and on again, but it's, you know, I just kind of have for a time being took a bit of a hiatus, explored some different stuff, enriched a different perspective. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of where I've been. Yeah. COVID did that to a lot of people, man. You know, there were some definite life changes. I mean, even for me, right? I, I was clinical, clinical, clinical. In 2018, I finished my EDD and I said, I'm never doing that again. I'm uh, I'm done, right? I'm, I was burnt out on academia. So I went right back to clinical because that's where I felt comfortable. That's where I was happy. Uh, but then COVID hit. And in 2020, I, you know, had to make that shift. I had to figure it out. Like, hey, wife's a type one diabetic. I don't really want to risk bringing it home to her, you know? And they're asking me to go and work in a full-time COVID unit. I don't know if I can do that all the time, you know? So I stepped away from the clinical and that week, like a God thing, there was a a position that opened up and and academia called. So I tried that out. And since then it's been great. I've been enjoying it, but um, yeah, a lot of, you know, people took on new hobbies. They learned new skills. They, you know, they did a lot of internal reflection and self-finding, which is awesome. Uh, I think it was good for for a lot of people. It was it was kind of a big reset, you know. We, we were kind of forced into periods of sitting there and and thinking and reflecting and figuring things out. So I think you know, as long as you could keep the lights on, like you said, and and you know, find that work and do what we needed to do, then then you know, it was a really good time for some people. And and I'd like to talk next a little bit about uh you know kind of the direction you're heading now is very heavy clinical, and you seem to be doing great with that and enjoying it. Um, but it makes sense now because, you know, HET is still a more academic driven. So it's like, doesn't really make sense to hop into that, you know? So uh, tell us a little yeah. bit about the clinical journey now that you've been on. Well, sure. And actually, you know, after, before I get into that, Scott, kind of going into that reflection over the COVID period, between us doing the podcast for all those years, you know, as we've kind of interviewed many different people, um, you know, my perspective on actually wanting to get into education did change based on everything. 
Um, and frankly, it kind of made me realize that maybe it's not something I really want to get involved in. Um, now, not saying I wouldn't do like some adjunct or, you know, some guest lecturing at times, but actually going into academia, into those roles from just what it sounded like on the grand whole, just didn't sound like it was something that I was really that interested in. So, you know, honestly, going more into the clinical route, um, at some point in between, I've really just gone through a lot of different training and education, of course. Um, I've actually just started treating a lot more male pelvic health, which I never thought when I graduated PT school I would ever do. Um, but it was kind of just presented there and kind of had to learn it on the fly. And I've actually really learned to like it as well. Um, been doing a little bit more trying to end up looking for getting vestibular certified, also working on just you know, doing a lot of other courses, especially related to running, weightlifting, pain. I mean, just expanding that quite a bit. Um, so right now I kind of kind of currently work at a private practice really actually close to where I live, which is actually convenient because during COVID, I was actually doing very long commutes every day. So that was uh, certainly draining on me. Um, that also kind of was a part of the reason why, which led to the podcast fatigue too, from <laughs> the drives. Uh, but other than that, I mean, between that, between being a clinician and pretty much right now I'm at my own, at a clinic where I'm the only clinician. So I get to basically do a lot of how I want to do it. And it's really great. I have full autonomy and support from my boss, which I'm very, very thankful for. Um, Cause that certainly is not the case in every uh, job in our profession, unfortunately. Uh, so it's been really good. And I'm just kind of liking the ride as a clinician. Uh, in terms of where the future heads for that, I'm not sure. Um, I think eventually down the road, I'd still like to continue being a clinical a clinician, continue being a CI, um, con con consider doing more adjunct work. I mean, I certainly would, would consider getting back into that um, at some point down the road. Um, you know, of course, coming up in the whenever, um, you know, at some point in the near future, um, when we're ready to start a family, I'm going to step away from practice, obviously, and focus more on that because... Um, Obviously, with my wife being a surgeon, you know, I'm just going to be the more flexible person or flexible parent. So I've known for a while I'm going to step away and then be, you know, part time dad, part time, whatever. I decide to balance my time with between all that. Uh, so other than that, I mean, then we've got she's got another two years here in Richmond to finish up her program. And then afterwards, she goes to fellowship and then. Who knows where we end up location-wise after that? That's awesome, man. Uh, you know, I, it's funny because when we started the podcast, I was a little bit more anti-academia and, and wasn't really sure it was for me, you know, whereas you were still kind of, you know, interested and I think maybe leaned toward it a little more. Uh, then you got the opportunity to teach, uh, you know, an anatomy course in the undergrad and that, you know, I don't know how that swayed you one way or the other, but, you know, I, I definitely think that if we look back several years where we started this thing, I would say you were maybe slightly more pro-academia. I was maybe more anti-academia and, and things have kind of flip-flopped now thanks to COVID. So uh, interesting how that worked out, but I love the idea of being a Mr. Mom and, you know, helping out with the kids and then also getting to pick and choose what you want to do clinically too. So it's a great option, man. It's a great, uh, a great lifestyle, and I think uh, you'll be great at it. So I'm really excited for your future, man. I can't wait to see what happens. But um, tell us a little bit about just overall. I mean, you. The cool thing is, you you still continued with you know a little bit of podcasting too for the clinic, you know. So I yeah. think some of your skill sets have have really grown over the last couple of years too. Tell us a little bit about personal growth. Like, I mean, you you know you you've done a lot in the last two or three years, you know partially because you were forced into it, but also partially because you wanted to try new things. And you, like you said, you're finding new hobbies and stuff. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, actually, so this podcast actually goes back. So actually when I was doing, um, you know, when I was kind of first starting it, I decided I was realizing, you know what, it's actually good to be able to kind of give clients and patients kind of a more in-depth education on some of these clinical topics, because, you and I both know working in certain outpatient settings, you just don't have the luxury of time to spend an excessive amount of time educating because you got to get stuff done in the session. So kind of using podcasts as kind of an adjunct to kind of really dive more into those different clinical topics. And also it wasn't just 
you know, me speaking. It was actually me interviewing other people, uh, me connecting with other local um, physicians or nurse practitioners or whatever on different health related topics. And of course, that led into networking and referral. So that was kind of a, a double win on that side. Um, so and it's been good. I mean, it's been really good to kind of give back to people um, in that way. It certainly is very appreciated by patients and such. Um, it's good to be able to kind of grow and do that. Um, in terms of other stuff, personally, a lot of other stuff that I've gotten into, I've been doing obviously just generally a lot more reading, uh, been doing a lot more kind of fitness related activities in general, um, gotten into rock climbing, obviously a lot more. And that has been tremendously fun. Um, doing a lot more um, mentoring of students, mentoring staff, because I have the person who is running my front desk is also a tech for me. And he is currently, um, well, he's going to be starting PT school actually in about a month. So unfortunately, I'm going to be losing him, but for good reasons, obviously. Um, but it's been really good to kind of teach him as well. And, you know, kind of, you know, really educate, guide him. And that's really helped learn a lot about me and myself too. And realizing how, you know, you are as an educator and how, you know, effective that you can be for that. And, you know, I definitely learned that there were some gaps in my education, um, you know, in terms of reaching every kind of person and realizing more and more that, you know, everyone is very different in what they respond to and what clicks for them and how you have to frame it. Um, so it's definitely been a learning curve in that way. And of course, we all encounter that with patients as well. Everyone's always different in that regard. So every clinician has to do things um, a little bit differently. Um, been doing a lot more courses in other different topics clinically too, between weightlifting, running, like I was saying before, other than that, a lot of the other stuff has just been traveling, uh, spending more time. Cause that's been something we've also wanted to do for a bit. Uh, we actually just got back from Vegas a few weeks ago and that was a fun, fun experience in that regard. So it's just, it's really just been more balanced. I mean, just like, again, just taking more education, personal development, such, uh, more spiritual health in all honesty, um, physical when it comes to health and such, um, just really across the board and kind of all different domains in all honesty. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the things that you mentioned, like mentoring and CI and patient education is still education, you know, uh, it may not be directly acad academic per se, but I love, and I just talked to somebody about this the other day. I love using the podcast as a library, like a reference, like, oh yeah, just go listen to this episode. We covered it there, you know, cause I, I don't, I don't have the time to, to go over this with everybody that asks all the questions, but I do have time to, to send a link over and say, Hey, listen to this episode, you know? So I love that using that idea of, of using it like a library to help patients learn more, you know, and, 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 and get a deeper dive into some of those diagnoses and stuff. So that's, that's really cool too. Uh, you said you dabbled a little bit in uh, your state chapter a little bit too for uh, APTA. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so I did. Um, so back then there was kind of a desire to have someone take up the role for membership chair for the state chapter. And uh, at that time I said, you know what, let's go for it. I have this kind of more unique perspective. I kind of see uh, both sides of the coin because you know, in terms of where non-members are and where members are in terms of with the APTA. Um, so I thought knowing that having, you know, of course, my reputation with the podcast and such, I hope I would be able to serve in a good role for that. And I realized very soon into that how really difficult it really was um, actually being able to move the needle on certain things, working within that. Um, and some of that wasn't really VPTA's fault because it did require just how many people we had, you know, if we had like between me, we had me and like four to five other people working on kind of doing these big changes for the entire state. Like that's a monumental <laughs> task and such. So, um, you know, we, it was, it ended up being good in the beginning, but honestly, after just a lot of time, it was just, I was just finding that if I'm being frank, it was just a lot of time. And we really weren't going to be able to hit some of the big changes that we knew we wanted to make, I wanted to make, um, to really try to bridge the gap between members and non-members. Um, and I just didn't see personally that it was really worth me spending that much time on it anymore when I knew it just didn't seem like the outcome was going to really be much different or change. Like I'm all for putting effort in and for change if I know something's going to be done with it. And I understand things take time, but 
uh, when it's made kind of apparent that certain things are not going to happen, it's a little bit demoralizing. So it kind of really didn't really motivate me to really do more. So I ended up stepping down because of that. And of course, because I was also getting busy, it was also around the time when I got laid off as well. So kind of, uh, that's kind of where that ended up going from that perspective. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that seems to be a, a, a sentiment that we hear often, uh, with a lot of APTA, uh, memberships and, and, uh, sections and chapters and all that. And, you know, uh, big ship, hard to move, hard to make change. Uh, so, you know, I hear well, you. And not everyone one. does that. And and yeah. let's be clear on one thing here. There's plenty of people that are good within it. There's plenty of people that work in different parts of it where that certainly is not the case. And I very much understand and respect that. Um, I know everyone has different experience and perspective based on where they are. And I'm not trying to say that mine was the only one. It's not. Um, but it's out there. You know, I know that that is a sentiment, like you said, that people have reported. Um, and, you know, we just got to say it is what it is. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we got to catch up with uh, Stephanie Wyrock a couple months back uh, at the PPS conference. So that was neat. We now get to catch up with you. So this is this is excellent. We love checking in on you guys and seeing what you're up to. Uh, now we get to ask the famous question that uh, you've asked many times, but now you got to be on the other side and actually answer it. Uh, if you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? You know, Scott, this is going to sound really kind of cliche, and I feel like I'm really beating a dead horse to death here because <laughs> I know this answer has been brought up so many times and we've interviewed people, and I'm sure it's been on countless others. But at the end of the day, I got to just admit, it's got to come down to cost. Yeah. Like, I, that's just, to me, and I'm strictly, strictly as a clinician, someone who's seen it from that side, who's not in academia, I, I just don't see how this is sustainable. I, I just, I mean, with the cost going in, the salaries people are getting, the insurance changes that's that are happening, I, I just really have concern that we're going to push pe a lot of people away. And unfortunately, I, I don't. I, the only way I really see it changing is if a lot of people end up just stop going into PT, um, and then that'll force that. In my opinion, that'll really force academia to actually really make a shift and again this is not the program directors this is the people way above them that set that so i get that but i don't see a big change happening unless applicant pools drop and well, then I, really concerned i will tell you this uh graduate school applicate or uh well yeah graduate school applications are down 10 percent nationally this year no, no no i'm sorry over the last two years four and a half percent alone this year so it was 10 percent. it's dropped 10 percent in two years and four and a half percent was this year so you know numbers are down people are definitely not looking into graduate school as much anymore um and i think we're going to kind of see that trend continue to tick upward little by little uh the, the fortunate thing is specialized licensure licensures like doctors lawyers pts nurses dentists all that anybody who needs a license is still probably going to have to go through some form of a graduate school so it'll probably be a little slower to hit those programs but it's coming i'm telling you the numbers are dwindling it's starting to, yeah. to, to taper off so yeah and i mean you could also make the argument too, like instead of changing the school costs, could you also change what PTs actually make across the board? Well, the, I just had you a know? great conversation. Um, with, there, there's an episode coming out uh, next week, I think you'll you'll hear it um, with Jamie Dyson, and he said the exact same thing. He said until the reimbursement is addressed, and we're getting reimbursed as primary care practitioners, just like doctors it's not going to change. We need, we need that reimbursement to be paid out at a doctoral level as a primary care practitioner. Uh, and until that happens, you know, we're not going to see much change in the salary or, or the amount we get reimbursed. So, right. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Well, Brandon, like I said, man, so good to catch up with you. Always a pleasure. Uh, you know, it, if people want to reach out to you and just kind of catch up with you and see what you're up to or ask you any further questions, where, where can they find you on social media and on uh, the interwebs? Uh, sure. I mean, pretty much just my name, Brandon Poen, Facebook. 
uh, Instagram. I really don't go on near as much as I used to. So if you do message me and I don't respond for a while, don't take it personally. I'm just not that great at it. Um, my email is always pretty simple too. Um, and that's just my name, Brandon Pollen at gmail.com. I'm pretty consistent there. Um, Instagram I'm on. I think I said that. Uh, I am on LinkedIn, but again, I very rarely check that. Uh, so your best bet if you want to reach me is by far uh, email. Awesome, man. We'll put all those links in the show notes, make it easy for people. Brandon, thanks for your time, man. Thanks for coming on. And uh, like I said, can't wait to catch up again. Always a pleasure, sir. Thank you.